Hello, everybody. I'm sure we're going to have uh, some people filtering in the next few minutes, but we want to try and get started as soon as possible because uh, unlike our usual format uh, where we have one lengthy uh, debate, we actually have two mini debates tonight uh, to, to get through. Uh, not to get through, that you will all enjoy. That's what I mean to say. Uh, but we want to make sure that we get uh, started as quickly as possible. Uh, as people are filtering in, I do have a couple of announcements that I, that I want to just throw out there. First of all, one week from today at Chipotle on University, uh, we'll be having a fundraiser. We, we would love to have funds to keep, on, uh, keep, to keep this going and to help our interns be able to travel uh, and do all the work that they do. So if you go to Chipotle and you buy anything and you mention our name, then uh, we'll get a certain percentage of whatever it is that you buy. So that would be really great. And you get to just eat awesome Chipotle Mexican food. It's like the best fundraiser ever. So uh, go ahead and do that next, next Tuesday. Help us out. And uh, I hope Casey gave you some cards uh, as you came in to remind you of that. So that'll be next uh, week uh, starting from at 5 p.m. and it'll be go until 9 p.m. Uh, we have the Regents Cup that'll be coming up in November. That's a really, really, really exciting event. It's the first time this has ever been done. The Arizona Board of Regents has given a whole lot of money to the three sister schools, us, NAU, and ASU, in order to put on a statewide public forum. Uh, and we are still accepting applications. So if anybody in the audience is interested in competing for a rather large scholarship prize uh, in November, then uh, come up and talk to me about how you can apply, because uh, you will definitely, definitely uh, enjoy that, and uh, you'll certainly benefit from it. Uh, if you are also just interested in joining our program and hanging out with our awesome interns, we have, unfortunately, a few people who are graduating this year, so we're going to have some slots open. So if anybody's interested in applying for our internship, also please come up and ask me, uh, and I'm happy to direct you uh, where you need to go. Uh, and while I'm on the subject of our uh, unfortunately departing, I mean, they're not dying, but they're graduating, uh, graduating seniors. Um, I, I do want to just give a quick shout out to our, our five seniors, our five interns who have helped us out so much this year. Um, and it really, really, it sucks to be losing them. Uh, I'm going to start like crying while I'm uh, saying this. But uh, my gra graduating seniors, uh, we want to say uh, a very big thanks and a goodbye uh, to Jenny Shamoon, to Sean Morrow, to Sydney Ruiz, to Brianna Ho Hoyos, and to Quajo Walker. Thank you, all five of you, for the work that you've done. And, uh, and this is the first year that this has ever existed. We just launched this at the beginning of the year. We've been getting uh, slowly bigger crowds. We've been getting a lot of word out, and it seems as though people are really enjoying what's going on. I want to make sure that uh, everyone goes to our social media at UA Debate Series, at UA Debate Series on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, you can find out about our future events, and if you comment, you can let us know what kind of topics you'd like to hear from us next year, because uh, we'd always like to engage the audience as much as possible. Uh, but a couple more quick thank yous, since this is our first year, uh, to Susan Miller Cochran and the writing program for giving us uh, what money we do have uh, before you guys go to Chipotle next week. So thank you to the writing program for, for helping us out uh, to submit. Yeah, there we go. Go ahead. Uh, to Samantha Kirby, who is our assistant director uh, and also uh, the, 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 the person I lean on whenever it is that I uh, am ready to collapse at the end of the day, uh, thank you so much uh, for helping us out. Uh, Zach Bergeron, our, our CFO, who handles finances because I don't know anything about that, uh, so thank you for, for helping us out and, and picking up the slack. Um, uh, I, I said this next one last time, but I cannot say it enough. Uh, to Dane, who just, out of the goodness of his own art, just shows up uh, and, and, and helps us out with all of our video and does an amazing job every single time. So thank you very much to Dane. And, uh, and finally, to, to all of our interns, I, I, I am in awe this entire year. I cannot believe how hard these kids work without me having to do anything. I mean, I really, really, really just watch them do all the work. They are absolutely incredible. Uh, they are the 20 most dedicated, hardworking kids I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, and you're about to see that tonight with our two different back-to-back -back debates. So we're going to have our overall topic, which is prison rights, and two separate debates. So let me get behind my podium so I can actually do my job properly. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, everybody, welcome. For those of you who have been here before, you know the process, but the way that this is going to work is Oxford-style debate, which means that at the beginning of each one of our two debates, we will be taking a preliminary vote based on whatever it is that you personally think about whatever the resolution happens to be. Uh, not based on the arguments that our debaters have given, because you will not have heard them yet, but based solely on the wording of the resolution that is behind my head, uh, you'll be taking our, your preliminary vote. So we'll take that in just a minute, uh, just to let you know the way, the way the voting system works. The green cards, if you are in favor of the resolution, whether this one or the next one, uh, please make sure that you pass the green card over to uh, one of our volunteers in the aisle, volunteers, interns, in the aisle. Uh, make sure that you pass the green card to them. If you are undecided, please make sure that you pass the uh, yellow card over to our uh, interns. And if you are on the negative side, please pass the pink cards over to the aisle. And that said, <coughs> uh, I am Ted McLoof, your host and moderator for the night. And our first resolution of the night will be uh, this. Prisoners should be given access to a post-secondary education during incarceration. Please vote yes, no, or undecided on the following resolution. Prisoners should be given access to a post-secondary education during incarceration. Once you have voted and you pass your cards down to the end, our interns are going to actually pass you the cards back once they've counted your votes so that you can have them for your post-vote as well. So uh, once more, uh, yes or no, or in, undecided to this topic, prisoners should be given access to a post-secondary education during incarceration. And make sure you pick up the center votes because that's where my mother is, guys. <laughs> Flew out from New Jersey to come, to come see this. Okay, uh, so that said, yeah, there we go. A big applause for my mother. Okay. So let's get into it. The, the debate will be three rounds. We will have opening statements from one of our debaters on each side of the resolution. There will be four minutes each. Uh, we are shrinking the length of the, of the, the introductions. Uh, after that, we'll have a, uh, our, our cross-examination round where our debaters will have a chance to address each other hopefully voraciously, and answer your questions, should you have them, so have your questions ready. Uh, and then we'll have our closing statements from uh, the other members of each team, after which we'll take our final uh, vote, and whoever ends up swaying the audience the most, rather than getting the most votes, will be declared our winner. So that said, opening up the debate on the resolution that prisoners should be given access to a post-secondary education during incarceration, we have Taylor Vandenberg. Hello. First, I just want to thank you all for attending tonight's event. So before the debate, both the affirmation and the opposition met to come to a consensus about the definitions and parameters of this debate. The word prisoners is in reference to all adult prisoners. This means any prisoner who committed any crime and who has been sentenced. We define college education as post-secondary education, which includes four-year, two-year, and technical colleges. Now that we have laid the foundation of the, of the debate, I want to address what you're probably thinking right now. Why would I, a model citizen, pay for the education of, for a prisoner in, in prison when I'm struggling to pay for myself? This issue is way too vast to only cover in four minutes, but I will give you some key points by addressing this idea in two ways, financially and practically. Financially, the burden is not as big as you probably think. An economic meta-analysis over the course of a few decades from the Rand Corporation shows the potential millions of dollars that could be saved. When comparing prisoners in an educational program, prisoners have a 43% lower chance of returning to prison than prisoners who were not in an educational program. The creation of educated prisoners saves prisoners and, and taxpayers more than $900,000 per prisoner. This equates to not only having a positive payoff for taxpayers, but also a positive effect on prisoners. So what does this mean? Implementing education into prisons would actually save you money, not cost you more. In addition, having college programs will make the prison system safer. A study by the Vera Institute of Justice discovered that, prisoners, that prisons with college programs have less violence among incarcerated individuals creating a safe environment for prisoners and prison staff. This also translates to increased personal income, lower unemployment, greater engagement in volunteering, and improved health outcomes. Do not believe Akshay and Juan when they tell you that this is not beneficial 
or effective. Not only does having educational programs in prison have financial and health benefits, but they have practical benefits for prisoners once they are released. Once prisoners are released, they often find difficulty with being reintegrated into society. An estimate from the Bureau of Justice Statistics indicates that almost three-fifths of those released from prison will be convicted of a new offense within five years of their release. This is because prisoners often do not have the skills and education needed to obtain employment. Thus, they resort back to a life of crime. Prison educational programs solve this issue as prisoners who participated in technical training programs had a 28% higher chance of obtaining post-release employment than prisoners who had not participated. So it would be most beneficial for us to have more educated citizens. 10,000 prisoners are released every week. So when these prisoners are released, because they are going to be released either way, they will, we would have more productive members re-entering our society. It is better for them to spend the time in prison improving, rehabilitating, and learning in order to successfully enter the workforce and help our community. We want as many educated people as possible to enter the workforce and therefore help our economy and our society. This is what education in prisons would provide. We would have more citizens benefiting our, our community every day. So if you agree that it would be most beneficial for us to save money as taxpayers and have as many citizens as possible to be educated and therefore advantageous to our society, I strongly urge you to stand with Vincent and I in the affirmation of this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. I just, black and white balloons for the prison stripes, I just got that, that's awesome, thank you. Um, and opening up the debate on the negative side of the resolution that prisoners should be given access to a post-secondary education during incarceration, we have Akshay Nathan. So first of all, I want to thank you all for coming to this debate. I'm just going to go straight into my two points. First point is that uh, their side, or that education is ineffective. While 64% of prisoners are academically eligible to enroll in a college prison program, only 9% of inmates complete a program. Even if they do choose to educate themselves in these college programs, the content of their education is abysmal. In a survey of 2,000 federal inmates, they state that they do not learn any useful content. One inmate states, we learn, learn how to crochet and how to review movies. Another states that no one ever fails a class and we receive certificates regardless of attendance. Through this study, they found the following things. One, most of job training programs from technical schools are only available to inmates who will be released in a few weeks, giving them insufficient time to learn, the f insufficient time to learn anything. Two, inmates uh, teach 93% of classes and lack rigor and, attend and substance. Three, these classes are nearly impossible to afford since the government refuses to give Pell Grants to prisoners with no intention to change this. Here's the icing on the cake. If pr prisoners take college classes, almost all of them learn from unaccredited colleges. Furthermore, in these programs, a high school degree or GED is required to access them. For many, they don't have these qualifications and, prisoner and prisons do not provide programs to help them do this. Now, I want to preface this next point. Why do we have so many people in prison in the first place? Politicians have criminalized new activities and increased sentences in a response to a climate of fear. But mass imprisonment also benefits some sectors of the economy. The Prison Guards Union of California is the largest contributor to California political campaigns. Private prison operation companies build and operate speculative prisons, making profit on a per-prisoner basis. Many powerful financial interests in the prison industrial complex are deeply invested in locking up more people, regardless of whether crime increases or has happened lately decreases. Now I'll go into the second point. There are better options. Clearly education doesn't work for the most part because prisons don't have incentives to let them go, as per the prison industrial complex, and also that the education itself is worthless. However, what if we can prevent them from going to prison in the first place? 
The first way we can do this is through primary and secondary education policies. In Chicago, they had eight-week job readiness programs, which led to the students having jobs in the summer. As a result, 43% less students committed violent crimes in the first place. Teens were less likely to commit violent crimes because they view them as less lucrative than the stability less lucrative than the stability that is provided from jobs and how these jobs gave them the skills to be more successful in the real world. Second is through mental health centers. A 2005 Department of Justice study found that 64% of inmates in local jails had a mental health concern, 56% for state prisoners and 45% for federal prisoners. According to the national, uh, or according to the same study, 20% of incarcerated individuals have been diagnosed with a serious mental illness. Now, some states have implemented these mental health centers, such as Colorado, Texas, and North Carolina, and they're seeing, uh, seeing these are be being seen as effective. North Carolina had a 42% reduction between 2006 and 2015 of the recidivism rate, or the rate at which people recommit crimes. Texas had a 25% reduction in the three-year recidivism rate from 2004 to 2013. Colorado saw probation rec revocations and the three-year recidivism rate around the same time frame go down by 23%. Diversion has also been shown to reduce recidivism rates in people with mental illness. This is a practice of placing offenders in mental health treatment instead of prisoner or jail. Judges may offer defendants reduced sentences in exchange for treatment. These allow them to not go to jail at whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you, Aksha. All right, let's move into our second round where again, our debaters will have a chance to address each other and answer your questions when the Q&A portion comes up. Uh, so let's start over with the affirmative side. Uh, so Taylor, you had mentioned the, concept, the, the possibility that actually uh, 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 providing this post-secondary education will actually be saving taxpayers money rather than costing them money. Can you go a little more in depth into that uh, and we'll have your uh, opponents respond afterwards? Yeah, so basically it's an investment opportunity. It's the, the way that this works is we invest in the, um, in the educational programs in prisons and that in we have sh studies have shown that after the educational programs there are less prisoners who reactivate into the cr into crime and therefore prison so the the lo lowering the rate of prison prisoners who are who are incarcerated actually saves you money because that saved it costs about we're spending like 182 billion dollars on the incarcerations on the incarceration system right now and it costs I think I said $900,000 and um, per prisoner, and that would be saved by the lowering of prisoners who go into our incarceration. Okay, so let's hear, let your opponents respond. Well, first of all, the um, uh, the idea that our opponents are trying to bring up of college education really lacks the individualized process that is needed to truly rehabilitate prisoners and to truly reduce recidivism in the future, and. And bringing these sorts of uh, college programs also creates a greater distance between prisoners that get released from uh, that get released back into the free world. It distances that sort of uh, like, like the antisocial behavior that, that that they experienced before going into prison actually increases, and they feel a lot more distant from society because they feel that they have to get that college education just to have a bit more opportunity to be seen more as a human that you know has been through the, the terrible conditions that, that they have undergone while in prison. Or, and additionally, um, going off like the whole economics point, they're stating how prisons are like it saves taxpayers money. However, the problem with this is that, again, as I stated in my case, the prison industrial complex exists. The prison guards union is the largest contributor to the financial contributions of politicians. As a result, they are these uh, prisons or there is little incentive to provide these programs on a large scale because if this, like this, uh, these programs be are implemented and they even work by re reducing recidivism rates, prisons are going to be like, okay, we're losing our population, which gives us money. Let's talk to the politicians so that they can enact new laws that criminalize that criminalize people even more. So is the suggestion that uh, that that allowing for this sort of access is going to make the system more corrupt? Um, I'm say I'm, I'm not saying or like one, it's not going to happen on a large scale, and two, 
if they are able to reduce recidivism rates in the long term, you're going to lead to increased criminalization. Well, Akshay, I find it funny that you bring up the prison industrial complex. Uh, this is such a major issue. We as a society have recently started focusing on judicial systems, trying to enact prison reform. We're telling our politicians that we're tired of them being in the pockets of both like private prisons and lobbyist groups. In fact, we saw a couple months ago that there was bipartisan support to start prison reform, start reform towards the judicial system. And frankly, when you guys come up in your speech and talk about how we have a prison pipeline issue, that we should instead be focused on the individualism of these prisoners, I think that's shutting out a large portion of the prison population. Sure, I agree with you, mental health is a major concern. But very few prisoners suffer from mental health. This is not a widespread problem. Why only give a few amount of people one selective benefit when you can give everyone in the prison system a wide benefit of a post-secondary education? In addition, I would love to talk about the mental health facilities that you are suggesting. If you bring, some, say there are a large amount of pr prisoners who need to go to these facilities, great, let's, let's provide that for them, but what do we do with the prisoners that are still in prison? Do they not deserve education because they don't have mental health issues? Right, well, I gave you guys two because they got two, but go ahead and well, respond. One, the insinuation that not many prisoners have mental health issues is directly contradicted by my st statistic that says a majority of pr prisoners have mental health issues. But you want to take that second part? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, in regards to like these mental health facilities and then people that would still remain in prison, you know, the, the, the whole idea of like, yes, we need to give them this college. Remember, this is like college and like uh, and like technical school education, something that a lot of these prisoners, uh, like even if they do obtain those sorts of degrees, it doesn't mean that they'll have more job opportunities. There's still going to be a lot of discrimination against prisoners when they get released back into the free world. Also, like, one thing I kind of want to go... Well, let's, let's, let's let them respond. We don't, we don't run the table too much. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, we actually do have statistics on um, people who have been... Oh, yeah. Okay. So we have a lot of statistics that actually show that when they are reintegrated into society, they have a better chance of obtaining jobs. We have... Um, it's a... Like, when... Prisoners that receive post-secondary education, usually what ends up happening, they are 43% less likely to return to prison. On top of that, they are 23% more likely to be able to receive a sort of form of employment. The main primary contributor for why we see a lot of prisoners end up going back into prison is because they're simply unable to find a form of employment. Why? Because they just sat in prison for a couple of years didn't obtain any sort of skills or education. And so now that they're out on the job market, they're not exactly as desirable to, let's say, someone that spent that same amount of time going to a technical school. So just so I can break this down so that, the, the, that we're all on the same page, it sounds like the affirmative case is suggesting that uh, if we were to allow this access, that we are going to end up having less recidivism. We're going to have less people, fewer people who are going back. I almost said less people, and I just told my students not to do that. Fewer people not going back to jail. Yeah, Whereas, whereas it sounds like the negative side is suggesting that uh, that actually is not the way to solve all of the problems that we have. Yeah, I do have a statistic on the, so a study by the American Conservative Journal showed that Minnesota prisoners, once attaining a post-secondary degree while incarcerated, had higher total earnings in a larger number of hours worked after prison than prisoners who had not had that education. Let's let them respond, then I'm going to take uh, questions from the audience so I haven't prepared. Here's the problem. Even given those statistics, Let's look, remember what I state in the first part about federal prisons, how the federal prison education system that exists right now is absolute garbage. What you're going to have to realize is that many of the people in these federal, uh, federal facilities are on drug charges, and a majority of these individuals are minorities. 60% of, of black individuals and 80% of Hispanic individuals in federal prison are in for drug possession, which, like, which um, is not necessarily an issue that, like, or to rephrase, or to, like, to connect this, minorities are more likely to be charged with the federal drug charge than white individuals. So you're sending minorities to federal prisons where the education system is broken. As a result, you're increasing the income inequality. You're increasing in income inequality in that you're allowing 
more white individuals to have this better education in the state system, while in the federal system, minorities are being given this like education that is subpar at best. Uh, I, I was nodding not because I agree with that concept. I was agreeing because I, 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 now I got it. Okay. Um, all right. So who, who has some questions for, unless you have a response? Very quickly, and then we'll take some questions. So I'm confused when you, so when you say that minorities are already at a disadvantage, how would education hurt that? How would educating minorities in the prison systems hurt them in this, like, in this income inequality that you're showing? Wouldn't it help them once they get out of prison? That, because they're so disadvantaged to begin with that wouldn't it help to give them an extra... Well, I mean, here's the like, thing. I mean, like what, like, what I'm saying is that, like, okay, sure, for those individuals, true, they have, like, the chance of that. But a majority aren't going to be able to access that because a majority of them are in federal prisons for drug offenses. And you're now having, like, white individuals who are able to... Like garner access to like this education, which so those individuals in state prisons are able to f get further ahead than individuals in federal prisons. I didn't realize education access in prison necessarily meant you had to be a specific race, what's important, or s commit a specific offense. These people are still in prison, regardless of whatever crime or race they may be. They're still serving years at a time. You can be in federal prison or state prison for a number of years for a drug charge. These people have the opportunity to receive education than rather simply sit in a cell for to serve out their three, four year sentence. All right, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, please, when you ask your question, make it clear whether your uh, question is for the affirmative or the negative. Uh, and please make sure that your question is a question, which means it has a question mark at the end of it. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so who, who, who has a question for, for our debaters up here? I raise them high. I can't, I can't, I can't see with the, with the lights here. Yeah, Casey. So I have a question for the negative team because I know that, you know, in this debate, I think that a big issue is the mental health inside prisons that you talked about. And so I know that probably the question is going to come up of, well, why can't we just do both? Why can't we have education and have increased mental health care? Do you have a reason to believe why we should spend more effort? Why is it a neither or choice? Yeah, okay. exactly. Great. Well, I mean, here's the thing is the mental health center like is almost a precluding thing from prison. It bypasses the prisons themselves. So instead of for example, like if you're convicted of a crime and you're de deemed to have like a mental illness, a judge dis will decide that, oh, instead of you going to a prison, you go to a mental health center so that you can help recuperate, help build better behaviors that allow you to become like, or to re reduce your recidivism rate, to boost like your, um, your morales, your values, and be a better uh, member of society. Okay, response? Um, this still doesn't solve the issue, like I said before, of great, let's do this mental health facility, but there's still prisoners in prison. That's not going to change that. So what do we do with the prisoners that are still in prison? They, they deserve education just like everyone else. Well, the, the, those prisoners that are in prison, they do also deserve um, mental health treatment while they are in prison, even if they have not been classified to have a mental uh, illness per se. or. Um, in, in, in retrospect, what we're trying to get to here is that instead of having these college education programs to teach them how to do chemistry and you know stuff that maybe won't really be relevant to them in the future, instead of focusing on that right now, there needs to be a greater focus on the fact that many of these prisoners themselves are illiterate, which actually decreases their ability to better communicate when they go out into society, to better be able to deal with like unresolved issues within themselves, to better be able to understand why they are currently in that prison system. And there needs to be more focus and a more individualized and tailored uh, form of rehabilitation that will not be provided by this college education and real rhetoric. Quick, could I say something real quick? Yeah. Okay, so even like, okay, let's say like, okay, education access is good. Remember what I state, 64% of prisoners have the access to it, only 9% use it. So that shows you that some, like, most people just simply don't take it. Additionally, I believe mental health, or like mental health issues are far more serious than educational issues in terms of person's well-being and ability to function in society. 
So Acha, you bring up how only 9% actually complete the program, despite there being 64%. But you're not exactly giving the full picture. The reason why that 9% is so low is because there simply is a lack of funding. Sure, while a prison may have a program to receive post-secondary education, oftentimes it's based on the prisoners not only like own finances outside of prison that they may have had in the bank, but it's also their family that is providing funding for it. Recently, the federal government enacted what is known as the Second Flight Program, which is essentially kind of like the Pell Grant system. And it's been seen that it's, uh, there's been 12,000 prisoners that have actually participated in this program in which they've received funding in order to receive this post-secondary education. And it has high graduation rates for these prisoners. We've seen that prisoners are taking advantage when the funding opportunity is there. It's just not there right now. So to say that 9% only complete the program, I think is very misleading to say in this debate. Uh, let's get a question, another question on the audience. So this is for the affirmative. So in regards to your economic benefits, with the length of prison sentences getting historically longer and longer, how do you expect to see economic benefits from the taxpayers <coughs> are footing the bills for prisoners to receive education when their sentences are 10, 20 years long? So what normally ends up happening with these longer sentences, it's primarily because it's normally a repeat offender. Because they're a repeat offender, the judge uh, is normally a lot more harsh with the sentencing because it shows in a way, hey, this is an individual that was given a second chance to reintegrate back into society, and what ended up happening was they're now going back to prison. We're reducing that long-term sentencing because of the fact that we're giving prisoners an opportunity through post-secondary education to reintegrate back into society. And so we've seen statistically that prisoners are less likely to go back to prison, and that reduces overall long-term prison sentences. In a, sorry, in addition, um, speaking about upfront costs, like I know that that's a concern, is um, we have a study that showed that it costs 10 times more money up front to incarcerate, to incarcerate an individual for one year than to educate that same individual over the same year. So upfront costs are even different and, and we're even saving money on the upfront costs with that too. So it's, it's even though there are some um, prisoners who have more, a longer sentence, there are still those prisoners who were gaining the momentum from. Quick response from the negative, then we'll take one more question from the audience and we'll move to close. I'm gonna go back to like the example of like how it happens in like federal prisons. Federal prisons don't, or like, like they have these like long uh, sentences, right? So you'd expect that if they had the education system that was good, they would be able to take advantage of it at some point. Like if it's like a four year education, maybe they can do it starting like their fourth year and go through the eighth year. No, that's not what happens. The, tech, the, like, the programs that occur that in the education system in federal prisons only occur within the last few weeks of, in, uh, of incarceration, which is, means that like, there's insufficient time to garner any knowledge whatsoever. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Um, I've got a favor of my mom here. Go ahead. Um, for the negative, I'm just curious. Is it the wording of the, are you opposed to the idea of the access to post-secondary education during incarceration? Or is the issue that you are taking up um, access to a quality, uh, credible, is, is, is that what, if that were on the table and being offered, uh, a credible, viable um, post-secondary education during incarceration, um, would that make a difference? It seems that most of your argument is just about the quality of this program as opposed to should any exist at all. I think the main thing we're trying to push here is that this shouldn't be the priority to to like make a great impact on recidivism rates, on, on actually making a huge impact and decreasing the recidivism rate. This should not be the priority. This should not be like, like the first approach that prisons should take. In fact, like the approach should be this individualization that we keep pushing towards to actually promote rehabilitation within prisons, which is supposedly what prisons are built for. But having this college education being like the priority that the, that the opposition is trying to focus on because they believe that they'll provide the greatest impact on recidivism rate is completely wrong. Quick response and then we'll move to closing statement. Uh, yeah, so um, we, I want to talk about the individualization that you want to focus on and the mental health um, 
that that supports and our programs do support the engagement of um, of like people's individualism and the and helping their mental health there's there was a study that showed that the education actually transformed the mental health and that prisoners were now seen as individuals worthy of investment the teachers and the coursework create a sense that they have something to offer and that helped prisoners learn how to communicate their emotions with themselves and with others, and I think that we can find that, those mental health benefits in our own education. Okay, anything else that the debaters want to cover, they can cover in their closing statements. Thank you for a spirited second round. Uh, I'm sorry to any of you who uh, I didn't get to with the questions, but you have a, another debate to ask questions during the second round of. Uh, Y'all should get your hands up quicker next time. Uh, and so uh, that said, uh, let's uh, listen to our closing statement from the affirmative side of the resolution that prisoners should be given access to a post-secondary education during incarceration. Mr. Vincent Hasso. Greetings. Tonight, we have had a wonderful, unique opportunity to have this dialogue regarding the issue of granting college education for those that are currently incarcerated. But before I finalize the issues that have occurred during this dialogue, I'd like to bring up a real-world example of a debate very similar to this one that took place between the Harvard debate team and the Eastern New York Correctional Facility debate team. Both teams debated a topic revolving around access to education, and to keep a long story short, the Eastern New York Correctional Facility debate team won. This wasn't a fluke, because they had defeated other nationally ranked debate teams around the country. This was a team comprised of individuals that were enrolled in a college education program while incarcerated. To quote Carlos Polanco, a member of the correctional debate team, we have been graced with opportunity. They make us believe in ourselves. I want to make it known here that funding education for the incarcerated is not a waste of our time and is most definitely not a waste of our money. It will be a critical step as we look to reintegrate those that are incarcerated back into our society. First, we need to analyze what the potential costs for having a college education program for the incarcerated will look like. I want to make it clear that this will cost a lot of money to invest with upfront. That is what happens with any investment in life. But what makes this investment worthwhile are the benefits that will happen in the long term. As Taylor stated in her speech, prison systems that have college education programs have been shown to save taxpayers more than $900,000 per prisoner. Breaking this down in reinvestment terms is critical because as a comprehensive econo economic analysis shows that for every dollar invested into prisoner education programs, it will ultimately save taxpayers $5 in reincarceration costs. That's a five times savings. That is a stupendous amount of money ultimately being saved. We as a society should be looking forward to saving this money in the long term. So that way we can invest in other programs that will not only benefit prisoners that can address things like mental health, but it can also address key fundamental issues within our society. A study from, from UCLA shows that a $1 million investment in recarceration efforts will only prevent 350 crimes. But when you take that same $1 million and reinvest it into correctional education, it will prevent more than 600 crimes. If you want to stop crime from happening, this is potentially the best option we have. But I'd like to address uh, the point in regards to prisoners reintegrating back into our society. Frank frankly, what's important to understand is to look at whether or not these prisoners are going back to prison. And it has been stated throughout this whole entire debate, prisoners engaged in correctional education have a 43% lower chance at going back to prison. This is primarily because of the fact that they are able to find new opportunity once they are released. As Taylor stated, three-fifths of those released from prison often end back in prison within five years. Programs that provide college education in prison have shown to increase the chances of employment by 28%. These individuals are not, going, are not being released from prison and simply committing another crime. Instead, they're able to find jobs, 
be productive members of society, and overall contribute to the collective of the United States. We want prisoners to have equal opportunity in order to make themselves better. And for these reasons, Taylor and I are proud to stand in the affirmation of today's debate. Thank you. Vincent's got a phenomenal internal clock. He comes in exactly at time every time. Uh, OK, uh, in closing out the negative side of the resolution that prisoners should be given access to a post-secondary education during incarceration, we have Juan Torres. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming again. We really appreciate the crowd. You guys have been great. Um, so as we begin wrapping up tonight's debate, I would like to emphasize the impact that our side carries. By individualizing rehabilitation for prisoners, the recidivism rate in this country will significantly decrease. The college education approach suggested by our opposition is a one-size-fits-all approach that actually rejects individualization. The effects of being incarcerated in America are horrendous. We, all know, we are all aware that the United States has the largest prison population. So large that the government actually had to turn to private prisons because they were being overpopulated. An alarming amount of prisoners are African American men that have been mistreated by institutionalized racism and the failed war on drugs. These men often have deeply rooted antisocial behavior, but how could one blame them? The lack of social change in this country has led to the conditions that he faces every day. <coughs> by implementing college material in prisons, those, incar those incarcerated will be given the opportunity to earn post-secondary education and up to a college degree. While in its face, this sort of result seems ideal in the world, uh, you know, it, and the world should collectively agree that college education, that, that a college educated prisoner is best. However, by pushing this sort of rhetoric upon prisoners, the distance between them and society grows even greater. Incarcerated individuals are well aware of the benefits of taking collegiate courses, courses in prison. For those who may be eligible for parole, the review, uh, the review committee that grants or denies parole uh, consistently looks at individual efforts that prisoners have put to try to rehabilitate as well. The courses that these prisoners attend and complete vary greatly on the facility itself. Some prisoners have admitted to watching films in their college courses that were far from related to the material they were supposed to be learning. Increased funding to provide education gives prisons administrators incentives to provide facially acceptable results. They tweak the numbers consistently they do have all these prisoners getting their certificates, but if the quality of that education itself has nothing to do with, with their personal rehabilitation and looking into any unresolved conflicts that they might have, then it is a failure. Since a massive decrease in uh, reconvictions is a concern for both sides of tonight's issue, we must move toward the rehabilitation efforts that have a larger impact. Austin McCormick was a criminologist who specialized in prison reform. In the early 20th century, McCormick was actually the assistant director of the, of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And although this was nearly a century ago, McCormick's ideas are certainly relevant today. There were demands for increased confidentiality, mainly, for communications within adult prisons. The urgency for increased confidentiality was based on the fact that an offender does not lose their right of privileged communications with psychiatrists and professional psychotherapists just because they are incarcerated. There is no way of convincing a prisoner of this right that he has except to give it to him, to respect it without question, and to safeguard it for him more carefully than he would for himself. The reason I bring this up today is because correctional group and individual therapy is at risk of failing because of lack of confidentiality. Since most prisoners will be released, it is the institution and state's responsibility to prepare inmates for a safe and successful return to the free world. In planning this sort of rehabilitative efforts, prisons must be staffed with experts who discover relevant information from prisoners directly. The, relative, the relevant information necessary to promote more efficient rehabilitation revolves around the antisocial behavior and, um, and feeling experience with the inmate. An increase of group and individual therapy must align, the in, must align with the inmate's best interests and with society's best interests as well. What this sort of college program that they keep pushing does is it brings an unselective mass treatment process in which a stereotype routine is followed and an individualization is rarely attempted. 
And the fact of the matter is, providing college programs to inmates will do none of, will do none of these things. It will do nothing to actually directly affect the recidivism rate. I urge a strong vote for us in the negative because the outcome our opponents are attempting to fool you with is unrealistic to the current prison population. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. I always feel bad for Juan because he has to go up right after me and he's the height of a normal man and so he has to like... <laughs> Uh, so, uh, here's how this is going to work. Uh, uh, in the end, we are going to take our, our final vote based on what you heard from our debaters, uh, both based on the information that you heard and also the performance of our debaters. Please make sure you take that into account when you're deciding which side you are on ultimately in, in the end, whether you are yes, no, or undecided on this resolution. Prisoners should be given access to a post-secondary education during incarceration. So, our second debate of the night actually is... Uh, pretty close to what you were hearing about in our first debate. Our first debate, we heard the term private prisons come up an awful lot. And so now we're going to be discussing private prisons directly. In our second debate of the night, we will be discussing the proposition, state prisons are more beneficial than private prisons. State prisons are more beneficial than private prisons. Let's begin our second debate of the night. We are keeping actually quite wonderfully to time. <laughs> Everyone, what's it? What is he saying? Oh, yeah, I know. Uh, we're keeping uh, rather wonderfully to time, which is great. Uh, so let's take our preliminary vote on the following proposition. State prisons are more beneficial than private prisons. Please send your cards in on this proposition. State prisons are more beneficial than private prisons. Opening up the uh, debate on the affirmative side of the resolution that state prisons are more beneficial than private prisons, we have Molly Krantz. All righty, hello. Okay. There are four reasons why public prisons are more beneficial than private prisons. First, private prisons are more dangerous for both inmates and prison guards. According to a Department of Justice report, private prison employees received 58 fewer hours of training, and private prisons had 28% higher rate of inmate-on-inmate -inmate assaults, and more than twice as many inmate-on-staff assaults. Additionally, Many private prisons lack adequate mel medical personnel. Horizon Health, the contractor for Arizona private prisons, was indicted as grossly incompetent in a report from the Arizona Department of Corrections. The report went as far to say as they were, there were as many deaths, quote, caused by or affected in a negative manner by healthcare personnel. Second, private prisons cost more than public prisons, even when given the easiest inmates to house. According to the ACLU, private prisons cost more than public prisons, even in the short run. Private prisons push down their costs by refusing to accept prisoners with severe illnesses or a history of violence. Despite this, inmates for the for-profit prisons rarely cost less than those in state prisons, and in some cases, cost as much as 1,600 more per year. This does not even account for the long-term costs caused by increased recidivism and increased incarceration rates. Third, private prisons have higher rates of recidivism, the rate of which prisoners reoffend after release. According to the, Department of Just to the Department of Justice, private prisons had an average recidivism rate of 70%, 20% higher than that of public prisons. This can, be attributed, this can be attributed to the understanding and increased rates of violence in these prisons. Even more concerning, private prisons had an incentive to, in, incentive to incarcerate their Sorry, private prisons had an incentive to increase, to increase instead of decreasing their rates of recidivism. Fourth, and perhaps the most concerning, private prisons lobby for policies that force the federal and state government to put more people in prison for longer periods of time. Private prisons have given $6 million to state politicians and over $800,000 to federal politicians since 2000. These efforts have been successful. For example, Florida now has a budgetary mandate to privatize some prison beds. Other lobbying efforts, including pushing three strikes or mandatory minimums, immigration enforcement laws, which result in prisoners with longer sentences 
It's a boon for the private prison industry, which is inexcusable given the United States incarcerates the most people of any country in the entire world at 2.3 million. Furthermore, according to the public interest, According in the public interest, most private prisons have lockup quotas of 90%. If states fail to meet these lockup quotas, they are subject to fines. In 2011, the ADC paid a private prison company $3 million for failing to provide them with enough prisoners. Dangerous and ineffective prisons that incentivize carceration, that profit off of human misery, and pushing quotas are not justice. So vote for the revolution vote for the resolution to stand against these practices. Thank you, Molly. <clears throat> and opening up the debate on the negative side of the resolution that state prisons are more beneficial than private prisons, we have Ashley Friedy. Okay, before I start my short four minute time, I just wanna thank everyone for being here and our opponents for being here. We're super excited to debate this in front of you guys today. Um, and with that, I guess I'll start my opening. Our opponents agree that our current prison system isn't functioning to its best ability. No one up here will stand in front of you and advocate for worse treatment of prisoners or program cutbacks. Initially, I found the defense of privatized prisons a daunting task to undertake. I found the idea of gaining capital off the incarceration of those who are marginalized and often prosecuted at a higher rate than their white counterparts hard to defend. So I understand why you may have voted for the affirmative at the beginning of this debate. Through my research, I understand the potential ways privatization could benefit all those involved. And as we move forward in this debate, I want you to focus on that aspect. Sorry. We negate the resolution that state prisons are more beneficial than private prisons. Molly and Finn will deliberately attempt to conflate the problems of the system with the concept of private prisons, but don't trust them. They're just trying to muddy the waters for you. It's imperative that we're all on the same page regarding the origins of private prisons in order to distinguish between the problems inherent in the justice system itself and privatization, which is not inherently beneficial nor detrimental. It's a utility. In the 1970s, Nixon declared a war on drugs that would be directed towards eradication, interdiction, and incarceration. The targets themselves were, and continue to be, people of color leading to an unprecedented rise of the marginalized dominating our prison populations. Experts believe the war on drugs and a general get tough attitude towards crime, crime have caused the prison population to more than double since the 1980s. The unprecedented rise of incarceration led to courts ordering for better conditions or reduction of prison populations. But that's the point. Private prisons weren't introduced as an extension of the system, but instead as a tool used by the system to put order to a potentially chaotic system. The very nature of privatized prisons allow for more accountability and more efficient results. Again, we can see that both state and private prisons have their issues. So let's look at the potential of each to be fixed in order to determine which is more beneficial. For a stronger private prison model, let's turn to Australia. Pri prison privatization does not involve governments contracting out responsibility. Contracted prisons do not have their own prisoners. The state allocates prisoners and transfers them between jails. Operators face penalties for everything from deaths in custody, assaults, self-harm, and escape, to failure to meet stand-mated, mandated requirements for programs. Private operators are rewarded when the prison is safer and prisoners are healthier and positively engaged. In order to win contracts, the operators present innovative programs and practices like gang management strategies, mentoring schemes, and holistic pathways for prisoners. The accountability and improved conditions safety and safety has led to the reduction of inmates reoffending. Contrast these built-in safeguards with the entrenched injustice of state and federal prisons, which don't run on a contract, leaving little accountability in the system. In fact, the system isn't so entirely corrupt that the system will protect the agents of the system despite the abhor abhorrent violations and offenses they commit. We see this all the time. For example, an 18-year-old black woman was arrested for having a small amount of marijuana. She was then raped by two police officers in the police van. When the woman went to the hospital, members of the police department visited her hospital room countless times to dissuade her from pressing charges. The officers were not held accountable. Another example is in a state prison, two correctional officers watched 24-year-old Richard Tavera with a history of mental health issues hang himself in his cell. 
they stood outside his cell for seven minutes before entering. Neither were punished. These aren't anecdotal instances, but rather entirely representative instances within the state prison system, and they always will be. This is because state and federal prisons are, in the end, the actual extension of an actual unjust federal government at the whim of the powerful and whichever party happens to be in power. So in the words of renowned <laughs> musician and activist, fuck the system, Tupac. not a true debate unless Tupac gets quoted at some point. Um, okay, so that said, uh, let's go ahead and move into our second round, uh, and I want to first uh, point actually to the negative side this time, uh, because it sounds like the, uh, the, the points that you guys are trying to make are uh, essentially that uh, beneficial is defined as the potential to best be improved, because you're pointing that there's, uh, there are problems with both sides of the system. Can you elaborate a little bit on that, and let's hear what your opponents have to say about that definition of beneficial. So interesting, throughout their entire opening, they never addressed that the state itself has issues. They should have the burden of proposing to better those issues, where if they're going to say that the private prisons are just as bad. The state is equally as bad, and they have the burden to put it on themselves to solve those issues. So basically what we're saying is, the criminal justice system systematically has been and will continue to be racist, um, which is why we have the 10 times incarceration rate as other populations. And it will take, as I stated in my speech, it is entrenched so deeply in the system that it will take decades upon decades to eradicate it. While when we look to a private contract, as in Australia, it's, you, it's simply uh, revising a contract to improve conditions, which is easier than eradicating decades and decades of racism out of an entire system. So to this we have two responses. The first is the resolution it does not state could be more beneficial. It's talking about the status quo. Right now, which one is better? The evidence clearly shows that while state prisons are not perfect, they are much better than private prisons, as our empirics demonstrate. The second point that they make is the illusion that you could simply change the contracts. There's no incentive to change the contracts. It's just as difficult to reform the private prison industry as it is the public. In fact, I would argue that it is more difficult because the incentives in the private prisons are even worse because they don't even serve the public interest. They serve their bottom lines. They serve their stockholders and therefore will always contribute to a vicious cycle of incarceration. Response? Yeah, I would love to respond to that. So first, in your first, um, Sorry. Um, to your second response, where you basically talk about how it's harder to alter a contract, um, et cetera. This is simply not true. You didn't point to our model of Australia at all. And it's not only Australia, it's New Zealand, it's Ireland, all these systems that work and continue to benefit. And as I stated in my case, because they have incentives for the healthiness of the prisoners, the happiness of the prisoners, that has the overall better treatment of the prisoners. Additionally, as far as it goes on, uh, when you were talking about state specifically, we've seen evidence, um, according to the Prison University Project, they cited that Baldwin State Prison denied hormone access to 36 transgender women who sued the state. Or, uh, and this has been like an ongoing issue with other prison systems that are state run. There was also the issue of Alabama, with Alabama having literally sewage running through the prison prison systems, having people stabbed and killed on a regular basis. These are not just private prison issues. Oh, I totally agree. I think that there are many problems in this system. But I would certainly say that the private prisons are empirically worse. They have 28% higher rates of assault. They have twice as many assaults on guards, and they have more guard assaults on prisoners. So they are contributing to I would like to, to point to your fact that we're, we're arguing about the system and how it currently is. And Frankly, excuse my explicitness, I think that's bullshit. Why would we be sitting here today in this debate if we want to talk about the system how it is? Uh, frankly, that is just advocating for a system to continue to have abuses on these human beings. So why would we not sit in this debate today and talk about how the system could potentially benefit these people? We're at, you guys are advocating for the continued abuses on both sides of these human beings. So I'd like a response to advocating for the status quo. If we hope to change things in the future, we need a realistic picture of what our current system is. If we're going to lie to ourselves about the negative incentives that private
prisons hold, we will never solve our issues. Private prisons in the United States certainly have negative connotations and negative incentives. I mean, look at the way that the detention centers that are privately owned are ran. But those detention centers are utilized by ICE, which is a government entity. The government is simply using private prisons as an extension of a corrupt state. What we're advocating for is if you look at the New Zealand example, this actually provides rehabilitative services and it looks at the fact that 91% of people who go are incarcerated have mental illness and they have over 70 clinics that are offered to those inmates. I mean, if you just want to assume that we could reorient the contracts, we could equally assume that we could re reorient our laws to end the war on drugs. Oh, to make that working since the 1970s? Is that working well? Because you continue to see stop and frisk, you continue to see people of color persecuted at a higher rate, despite this happening since the 50s. So if you want to change the law, please direct me how to do that, because obviously it isn't working. I am not in favor of, I'm saying that yes, we ought to change the laws, and this is a difficult no, fight. Because it's not working. How are you going to change the contracts? Give so, me a specific well, plan. Before, before With the incentives the laws, that are currently in place, how are you going to do that? Are you advocating for the continued abuses in the current system? No, I'm not. I'm advocating then that we change advocating the system for? away from private prisons. So how is that going to happen since the 1950s where we still see the persecution that's been changing? It's going to happen because people like is us in this happen? room are going to push for the end of private prisons, or would you rather support private prisons? I think yeah, it's huh? also... <laughs> Thank you. I think it's also important to recognize that the, the, the resolution for tonight is that pr state prisons are more beneficial than private prisons. We're not, we're not acknowledging, we're not, not acknowledging, we're not disputing any specific plans. We are just saying that we're giving the, our evidence of why private prisons are unfavorable. So right, that's like the awesome thing about having a debate space is you get to manipulate the resolution, right? So the way we're manipulating the resolution is state prisons being more beneficial than private prisons. We're arguing that private prisons have far more of a breadth to be beneficial and productive to the inmates by giving you case studies from outside of the you know, from outside of domestic means. So we're still interpreting it the same way. I want to throw a question actually over to the affirmative team since, since this is what we're talking about and how the interpretation of the resolution. Uh, why <clears throat> why is it imperative to argue uh, the the state of prisons right now rather than the potential, which is what your opponents are arguing? I think that the most important thing to understand is the state of incentives. We are arguing that private prisons have a fundamental incentive that is at odds with society. They don't care about society. They care about their bottom lines. We need to acknowledge this. If we want to build a system based off of private prisons, we have to acknowledge that there is a misaligned incentive. We have to look to this misaligned incentive before we attempt to build a castle on top of sand. Response? Um, again, I'd like to point out, as I did in my speech, Private prisons are a utility used by the state and federal they're not go away. government. Mm -hmm. They're not going to go away because, as I said before, the criminal justice system is systematically and inherently racist. And so, so they will continue to arrest these marginalized people at 10 times the rate of the rest of the world. And what are they going to do with these degrading state and federal prisons? They have to turn to a tool, which is privatized prisons. So if you want to eradicate privatized prisons, if they're so bad, you have to change the federal and state system. Um, the other way to kind of look at it is private prisons aren't going to go away because it's so inherently important to like America's mindset to have like this private industry, right? It's just not going to dissipate. So, but the way you can look at it is like charter schools, right? Charter schools aren't public schools and they're not privately funded. They're somewhere in between. Like we can, we have the ability through this debate, if you vote in negation, to potentially rework the way that private systems are. You either work with them or you just, there's nothing you can do our, because they'll always exist. Our opponents are assuming something. They assume that we can't get rid of private prisons. What about the dozens of states that have banned private prisons? Actually, a majority of states don't have private prisons. And the other states should follow in their example by banning this institution that empirically is worse for prisoners and worse for society. So I'd like to point out what happens to when you ban these private prisons. I'll let you have your comment and then we're going to take Great. questions from So Finn wants to navigate the issue and where he points to these states who have banned privatized prisons, right? And that sounds great because they're constraining privatization to make it seem really awful, which I can understand that direct connotation. But when you look at what happens when you ban these privatized prisons, they're still arresting people at 10 times the rate as other places. So if you don't have that utility, the privatized prison, we're looking at worsening conditions, worsening conditions for prisoners and inmates because the amount that's overcrowding, overpopulation, and then the spaces that they're in and confined to are degrading at a higher rate, which therefore leads to 
human rights violations, but also a greater cost to taxpayers. So if economics matters, as was the human rights, you have to vote in the negation. Let's get some questions from the audience, please. Uh, I saw this hand up first and then right, right, right next to you. Yeah. All right. So uh, this is for the uh, negative side. So clearly, um, clearly <coughs> you think that the prisons need to be um, changed from the state to private. And uh, I think that it's also pretty difficult from, you know, to make that, uh, sorry, oh, this is before. Uh, so I think it's going to be more difficult to change a state prison into a private or to predominantly have a private system that in America rather than have state prisons. But clearly that's worth the um, struggle of doing that. So how might you change the system that's already like, in place, you know, firmly and strongly in the United States? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think you've misunderstood our case. We're not advocating for turning state and federal prisons into private prisons, or we're not advocating for an addition of more private prisons. What we're advocating for is, like we said, there's obviously inherent problems in both. Um, and obviously, the state and federal system, as I've stated before, is systematically racist and has arrested these, arrested these people at higher rates. What we're advocating for is private pri that private prisons are more beneficial because when we look to these places such as Australia and they Sweden and New, New Zealand and Iceland, it's easier to reform that and improve prison life within those privatized prisons than to change an inherently racist system. Quick response, and let's make sure these are very quick volleys between one answer from each side because we want to make sure that we, we wrap up soon. Yeah. Um, I would say that if you think that something is more beneficial, why would you not want all prisons to be private? Additionally, I'd like to say that if you want to change private prisons, you're going to face the exact same systematic struggles that you will changing the state prisons. So there's no advantage for, for the negative there. Um, uh, Emily, had you ran it before? So the main part when we were analyzing what's interesting is there's actually not a lot of data because the DOJ works on both sides. So they examine through private prisons and they examine through public prisons, state prisons. And so they've done this like cross analysis where they're examining different models. And because New Zealand is using like the capitalist sector to create these uh, these like new prisons, it's on a different form of contract. So the state is like, it's like a quasi like state private involvement. And that's very possible with the United States. We've seen that happen before. And I think it's important that we not limit ourselves to a domestic scope, especially if we're trying to solve a humanitarian issue. It's something that should be um, gleaned from other areas than just the U.S. Response? That's a non-answer. There's no reason why the systems there would work, nor is there any reason why we would actually reform our current system given the incentives that we have. I think that's even more of a non-answer. Well, because I was responding to what she said. She didn't answer the question, so. Uh, let's get some. <laughs> Some non-non-answers and non-non-questions. Uh, yes, please. Um, I have a question for the negative. So you said that private, pres private prisons have more incentive to treat their prisoners well. But um, why? Why would they have more incentive when it is privatizing things and capitalism in general is about making money? So why, when the prisoners aren't giving them any money, what is the benefit to them treating their prisoners better? That's an excellent question, and I really appreciate it because now I can explain it more to the audience. So basically what happens when we look at these models in Australia and New Zealand and Ireland, um, the reason that there's incentives is because it works on a contract with the government. So the government, when the prisoners are more happy, when the prisoners are more healthy, and when there's a reduction of the rate of reoffenses, um, the government gives that prison more money, which then they funnel into more of those programs, like the mentoring schemes, the gang management um, theories, that kind of stuff. Uh, response? What was the question? It was, it was mainly a question for them. We can move on to another question. Uh, uh, yes, please. So I have a question for Nick. So um, the app side brought up a few statistics. Um, and I know you guys mentioned in anecdotal terms like stories of people in private prisons who may have been mistreated. Um, no, definitely were mistreated. But the app brought up some statistics like the rate of recidivism is 20% higher in, whatever, in private prisons versus state prisons. And I didn't hear you guys address that. What would cause that discrepancy if private prisons are more incentivized to treat their prisoners well, 
then what would cause the discrepancy that more prisoners in private prisons should be offended after being allowed? Right, so do you want to answer this? or Can you rephrase the question? <laughs> why, would, why would prisoners in private prisons have a higher rate of recidivism than prisoners in state prisons? Okay, so uh, again, we've cited several different types of programs. So the way that... Um, I believe it's the Auckland South Corrections Facility Program runs, is they focus on the cultural identity within the program. So they, they analyze things on like a socioeconomic level and like a psychological level. And that's like something that private prisons only are privy to. And this is something where they examine like what the root cause is for, these, for the offense in the first place. And then they're able to work on rehabilitative reasons and most of them do not reoffend. Response? That's another non-answer. The, <laughs> the, the, the Finley, the Finley you can't take away all the grounds from the affirmative by saying you did not limit this resolution the, to domestic. You had to exam- like limit it to domestic. Finish. The examples that Aaron is providing are accounted for in the empiric. So if they worked, the empiric would be the inverse. But it's not. Private prisons have a higher but rate of... we're talking of- about it on a global scale when you've limited it to the United States. We admit that both privatized the systems bullshit. and the federal and state system in the United States sucks. Why? Because it's built on a system of inherent racism where they want to drive up incarceration levels because it's racist. So we have to look to other global scale scales when they have a lower rate of incarceration because obviously they're doing it better than the United States. I'm not so arrogant to say that Americans do it best. If it did, we wouldn't have a 10% rise of incarceration than the rest of the world. I'm saying Americans do it worse because we have private prisons. So why should we? Where's your evidence on that? The case, well, the empirics that Rafa will clearly point out. Where do privatized response. prisons come from, Finley? <laughs> why are they there? Um, we're, we're all going to end up in prison after our debaters kill each other. Uh, so, no, so I, let's, I really so, would like an answer. Why are privatized prisons here? Well, luckily he's luckily he's about to give his closing statement, so he can go ahead and give you an answer right there. Thank you. And not that I need to announce his name, but closing out the debate on the affirmative side of the resolution, we have Finley. I want to thank you all for being here for this very important topic. Our opponents claimed at the beginning that we are muddying the waters. In fact, it has been the exact opposite. This debate is pretty straightforward, and I'm just going to walk you through our case again to show you exactly why private prisons are worse than state prisons, and why state prisons are far more preferable. Our opponents stated that, quote, there's not a lot of data. In fact, there is a lot of data, and a lot of it was presented in our case. Private prisons are worse. I want you to imagine yourself as a prisoner. Would you rather be put in a private prison where your chances of being assaulted are 28% higher, your chances of being assaulted by a guard are twice as high, or would you rather be put in a state prison? Would you rather be put in a private prison where the health care has been stated as, quote, grossly incompetent? Now think about it from a society-wide perspective. Would you rather have a system full of private prisons where the recidivism rate is 20% higher, leading to more crime? Would you rather have a system that has private prisons that push for three strikes policies, that push for higher mandatory minimums because they fundamentally are tied to their stockholders who wish to make money and have no incentive to help the society at large? I'm going to now go through a couple of points that were made in my opponent's case by Ashley. First, my opponents say that we conflate the problems of the system with private prisons. No, we acknowledge that our system is broken, but we point out that private prisons are part of the reason why. Even if you accept our opponent's point that it was the war on drugs was the only reason for the jump in incarceration rates, it is undeniable that private prisons have contributed to a vicious cycle that keeps these rates going up. They donate millions of dollars every year to politicians that are willing to push for an agenda that mandates we send people to prison. I would remind you that private prisons have lockup quotas. 90% of the beds must be full, otherwise the state pays a fine, just as Arizona did. They paid a $3 million fine because they didn't put enough people in cages. Is that the kind of system that you want? 
where the incentives are aligned to put people in cages. These lockup quotas affect police departments because they have a pressure from the state to provide more people to private prisons, specifically so the state doesn't have to pay these fines. Private prisons are, have effectively lobbied in states like Florida, where they have a budgetary mandate to put a certain number of people in private prison beds every year. This is not justice. I would also like to bring up cost. Our opponents talked about an economic benefit potentially from private prisons. This is an illusion. Our opponents failed to address the ACLU evidence which showed that private prisons, even in the short run, can be more expensive, citing many states, such as Hawaii, where the cost of incarcerating an inmate for one year in a private prison is $1,600 greater than it would be for a state prison. You've heard a lot of empirics in this round. You've heard a lot of numbers thrown at you. But I want to end on a larger point. We are humans. We respond to incentives. The structure of our institutions is a great indicator of their outcomes, of their successes. If we structure our institutions through private prisons to have an incentive to lock people away, this is unacceptable. Is this the system that you want with this incentive? I would say no. I would say vote against that. I would say vote for a system that has society as its main benefactor, not the stockholders. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Finley. And closing out uh, the negative side of the debate and the entire debate and the entire night and the entire year, <laughs> we have Aaron Fowler. All right. Going into the closing arguments of this evening's debate, I think it's important to recognize my privilege. To assume a position was something that surveils people of color at higher rates. I was so stubbornly opposed prior to researching and examining the precise nature of the resolution. But the resolution very clearly states beneficial. So I ask the audience members to weigh this on this mechanism when you cast your vote. One of the things that was discussed by our opponents was the cost and the issue of cost. The money that would go into the state or would go back to the taxpayers was recycled back as profit for the privatized prison to support better programs. And on the comment about treatment of prisoners, according to the DOJ, they released a statement in 2016 that there's actually less sexual assault in private prisons and there's less drug use in private prisons. Also in 2012, 20 plus states have switched to privatized healthcare. So if you buy any of their arguments about healthcare, there's already a massive shift to privatized healthcare, even if it is a state prison, so therefore they don't garner any ground on that argument. <clears throat> state prisons are no better. If you find yourself still having faith in a corrupt system, I offer you a piece of evidence from the investigations of the DOJ and Alabama state prisons. Here's some of the violent activity reported during a single week in September 2017. Friday, three stabbings, including one resulting in death. Saturday, one beating and a drug cache. Sunday, two beatings, one stabbing, one sexual assault, and one beating of a sock with a metal lock. Tuesday, one discovery of drugs and arson. Someone literally tried to light someone on fire in their bed. Wednesday, one sexual assault. Thursday, one beating, one sexual assault, and one overdose that resulted in death. To further the example of state corruptions, Sessions, who was a longtime senator in Alabama, had a policy that still stands that requires lawyers to prove that the prison complaints are unconstitutional and a sunset date. Sunset dates essentially mean that these complaints will not always reach investigation because they will expire before the sun time, and this means that they will not get the proper care that they deserve. <clears throat> there are two ways to approach the side Ashley and I were given, either pro-privatization or anti-state. We chose the latter to focus on first. The affirmative in today's debate has pointed out the evils of private prisons, but neglected to propose ways to better the problems of state prisons. The state itself has proven to be built upon a racist infrastructure, and the use of private prisons is a totally separable element that happens to be used in this unjust system. 
State-run prisons are still privy to the precursors of police brutality, strike policies, stop and frisk, and mandatory minimums, which all aim to incarcerate people of color at higher rates. If we can't reject the state in its, in, its, in its entirety, we can examine the benefits of a prison system that offers rehabilitation programs, education, dialectical, behavioral, and cognitive therapy, which leads to other benefits that only private prisons can access. On a global scale outside of the United States, private prisons are put on contracts that hold them accountable federally, but have the financial wherewithal to devote their time to teach and amend behavior. Additionally, the idea of incarceration, simply for the means of retribution theory, does nothing but put those incarcerated at a higher risk of reoffending. Statistics show that the rates of suicide in prisons is closely connected to overcrowding, which is yet another instance in which private prisons mitigate the harm. Let us reference an article by the Brennan Center of Justice that examines the Auckland facility in New Zealand, which humanizes prisoners by one, referring to them by their first name, calling correctional officers reintegration officers, allowing prisoners to live in a dorm toward the end of their sentence. And another aspect that I find incredibly important is how the private prison examines the high rate of indigenous Polynesian people incarcerated and created a cultural center within it that allows them to uh, have a collective identity and celebrate their holidays, not to mention the 70 clinical programs that's available to all inmates. There is no way for Finn and Molly to prove that the state will work better in the future. But we, what we can do is we can consider which of the two options has more potential to create a better system. Private prisons are not inherently good or bad, but influenced by the state behind them. Therefore, we have the ability to make private prisons beneficial or detrimental. The state wants you to believe that private prisons are corrupt. Why are we so conditioned to have such a visceral reaction when we hear the concept of private prisons? The focus should be on safer conditions, rehabilitation of prisoners, upholding morality, mental health, and helping those who work in the facility. When the state is this broken, we should be open to anything that has the potential to work. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, and now comes the really, really exciting part. Uh, you get to vote on uh, the winners of these debates. I'm going to also read out the winners of our first debate uh, as you guys are doing that. I'm also going to announce the winners of the raffle, so make sure you have your raffle tickets out as well. And while all that's happening, we're going to be counting your votes for the second debate so we can declare all of our winners. So please make sure that you hand in your cards so we can have an, as accurate a count as we possibly can. Huh? I'll just announce it. I did the math already, so. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, while, while all this is happening, I just want to remind everyone again that we will have applications open because of our unfortunate five slots that will be open once our uh, interns graduate. We have five slots open for applications as, for interns. And we also have applications uh, that you can submit for the Regents Cup in the fall. Uh, can I have our, the uh, debaters from our first debate come on up so we can announce the winner and so that you can bask in the glory as everyone sees. Okay. All right, everybody. Let's announce the winners of our first debate. There we go. Drum roll, please. Thank you. Uh, the vote before our first debate, 43 of you were in the affirmative, voting for Vincent and for Taylor. Uh, four of you, and only four of you, were uh, in the negative and voting uh, for Juan and for Akshay. And there were 12 of you who were undecided. Uh, in the end, ultimately, uh, 56 of you ended up voting in the affirmative. They picked up, six, uh, they picked up 13 votes, ultimately, in the end. Uh, undecided, there were eight. So four of you went down. And it uh, looks like the negative team picked up, uh, picked up eight votes because they ended up getting 12, uh, which means that our affirmative side was our winner. So congratulations to the winners of our first debate. 
Uh, I'm now going to announce the winners of the raffle as our lovely interns count the uh, votes for the second debate. Uh, so please have your raffle tickets out. We'll find out who's going to end up winning uh, both or, or one of two of our, uh, our Starbucks disc gift cards. So will the ticket holder of ticket number 865177 please come on down? 865177. Is that anybody? All right. Woohoo! Go, Lily. There you go. And we have one more. So will the ticket holder of eight This is this is for a Starbucks gift card, even better. Eight six for uh, eight six five one nine seven. Eight six five one nine seven. Who's that? All right. All right. All right. So let's get uh, to our second second debate. We have our winners. We have uh, the result of our second debate. Uh, at the beginning, five of you were voting in the negative. So congratulations to you guys. Uh, you are not a very negative crowd tonight. That's great. Uh, uh, 15 of you were in the affirmative, and 51 of you were undecided uh, over whether state prisons were more beneficial than private prisons. Uh, in the end, though, only two of you were undecided, so we changed a lot of minds tonight, which is great to hear. Uh, the negative side ended up uh, with 17 votes, which means that they picked up 12, and the affirmative side ended up with 46 votes, which means that they picked up whatever that is. Uh, 31 votes, 31. So congratulations to our winners. Congratulations to all of our debaters, and congratulations, and thank all of you for, for coming and, and, and hanging out and sticking it out. And please come up and uh, ask me for any information you might need. Thank you very much for coming. Have a great night.